So I'm a third year PhD student at the University of Iowa. I specialize in 18th and 19th century British literature with focuses on science, medicine, the Gothic and crime. Um, this study uh, treating the socially grotesque man, experimental medicine and the Gothic is an excerpt from a much larger work in progress that's eventually going to become part of my dissertation. So I really welcome any questions or comments on its potential development. In this study, I will be examining the shared fear of what lies under the skin of human bodies and social practices as seen in three Gothic texts written within 15 years of each other at the end of the 19th century. Uh, first up in time, we have 1883, Wilkie Collins's Heart and Science. Next up, we have 1886, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson. And then finally, 1897, Bram Stoker's Dracula. These are all exciting examples of stories with unwell, unruly, and unconscionable bodies that are either in peril or perilous themselves, and that employ and sometimes invent experimental medicine that is used to either endanger or bring these bodies under social control of the late Victorian age. Something I want to examine is whether this medicine is actually itself a dangerous medicine that does not heal but hurt. And something else of particular interest to me, which will act as a refining agent in sifting through these big ideas, is how the authors frame the medical issues and treatments as documents. Now, Dracula is famously known as a book of compiled documents, which as Katrine Bolin and Raphael Engelbein have argued, was directly influenced by Collins's The Women in White, published nearly 40 years before that time period. Um, we also know that um, in Heart and Science, there are several chapters where Wilkie Collins uses his epistolary mode um, to move the plot along. And then Jekyll and Hyde infamously ends with a nested narrative document and confessional document. But for the purposes of discussing these texts, I want to analyze aspects of them as medical case notes, whether delivered written or orally, official or unofficial, as they chronicle the experiments and ailments that have either befallen or risen from these bodies in question and examine how the experimental medical treatments can act to harm, heal, suppress, and or conceal unconventional issues. So I use such language because through this discussion of health issues and treatments, these case notes act as clinical metaphors for real concerns of moral and imperial crises in the period. In the text in question, I focus in on failures and fixes of English masculinity and the rise of scientific and medical progress with its accompanying ethical concerns. To briefly summarize the text and thus specifically hone in on the qualities I want to discuss in each, we have the beloved Dracula, which on its most superficial level is the story of a group of humans encountering, falling victim to, and battling a vampire. I was inspired to connect this to the other texts as due to vampiric problems, saying it lightly, we have a proliferation of patients and caretakers in the story. And for the purposes of this study, I want to examine case notes that involve both Jonathan Harker and R.M. Renfield as patients, and Sister Agatha and Dr. Seward as their respective caretakers in quasi-medical settings. Harker's experience as a victim of vampiric feeding at Castle Dracula permanently alters both his role in the story and his contribution to the compilation of Dracula-related documents. Although he's the first character we meet in the tale, by the time he has escaped Castle Dracula, he's no longer in charge of his own narrative. The letter that Harker sends to his fiancee Mina, which we have uh, Mina's response to this letter here, the quote for it. Um, this letter has been dictated to Sister Agatha, his caregiver at the sanitarium where Harker is recovering. In a related paper, I've argued that the case notes tracing Harker's brain fever and emasculation directly relate to the lack of Harker's voice later in the narrative. Although he's not been overtly experimented on, he shares this damsel role with Carmina Graywell in Heart and Science in that his fiance nurses and restores him to health. Parker's clear devaluation in the narrative and seeming unreliability after escaping Dracula is potentially because Nina and sisters Agatha's notes on him reveal that Harker is emasculated via brain fever and under, unable to stand with the hale and hearty men of the crew of light. We come to know R.M. Renfield, the fly swelling raving patient, who at the top here I've included sort of the action shot of him, because um, I thought that was very indicative of his character. And we come to know him through the case notes of his caregiver, Dr. Seward. He is a zoophagous patient suffering madness in Seward's asylum. And although Renfield has later on a much more active part in the plot, I want to focus on Seward's reportage of Renfield and Seward's experiments on Renfield. <laughs> 
It's important to note that we never see Harker bitten by Dracula and we never really know for certain how Renfield became linked to Dracula. However, we're meant to go on the assumption that their mental health problems are vampirically tinged. In his recovery sanitarium slash eventual wedding bed, Harker's illness comes across as similar to depictions of Victorian men with nervous disorders who due to their illness were feminized. Per Jane Wood, it was a social, sexual, and psychological anomaly in a culture of robust and resolute manliness. And thus the assumption was that men suffering from nervous disorders would generally be frail, pale, and weak. There was also a suspicion that literary men were prone to develop nervous disorders. And Harker, who is a literary character who reads and writes during his time in Castle Dracula, is there for set up as a prime patient. This potentially intellectually linked disorder also shares commonalities with brain fever. Parker's illness straddles the line between the Victorian ideas of brain fever and male nervous disorders, sharing symptoms of both of these physically and emotionally weakening illnesses. Renfield psychosis, however, which is alternatively referred to by a couple of names by Seward, only serves to make him more lethal and determined, at least in some of his mood swings. Moving to heart and science, which is Wilkie Collins's anti-vivisection argument wrapped up in a sensation novel, um, critics have argued over whether or not this is an indictment of scientific experiments in the name of progress altogether, or just of a specific bad science. The main action of the story revolves around Carmina Graywell, a half Italian Harris to be born and raised in Italy, who has come to live with her calculating scientist aunt, Mrs. Galilee, along with her family in London. And it's here that she encounters and almost immediately falls in love with Mrs. Galilee's son, Ovid Beer. He's a local surgeon planning to leave town due to overstrain from his work. We also meet Dr. Ben Julia, the villainous vivisectionist here who takes advantage of a potential patient experiment when Carmina falls ill, although Mrs. Galilee and Miss Minerva, the governess, are also framed as frightening intellectuals. In his readers in general preference to heart and science, Wilkie Collins calls attention to vivisection as the true villain of the piece. Vivisection was a popular topic and divided literary types as well as scientists and medical professionals at the time. Just to name a couple, uh, the year before the Cruelty to Animals Act was passed, Lewis Carroll wrote a pamphlet um, vehemently against vivisection. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have Algernon Charles Swinburne, who wrote what's frankly a nasty little rhyme, specifically calling out Collins as being too mission oriented at the cost of writing, saying, what brought good Wilkie's genius nigh perdition? Some demon whispered, Wilkie have a mission. Jessica Straley notes in her work on this text that in order to devise the danger facing his heroine, Collins borrowed from anti-vivisection literature the caveat that if experiments on animals be allowed, then human victims are next. The text was published in 1883 during a time of much vivisection and anti-vivisection debate. During the writing of it, Collins was in contact with Francis Power Cobbs, a main figure in the anti-vivisection movement. For Straley, According to Cobbs and her allies, women were the most likely victims. Campaigning for women's rights before taking up vivisection, Cobb often linked the medical mistreatment of animals with the legal exploitation of married women, comparing neglected and abused wives to caged birds, workhorses, and beaten dogs. Others literalized the metaphor, warning that vivisectors were unable to differentiate their wives from the animals they callously dissected. Heart and Science was published seven years after the 1876 aforementioned Cruelty to Animals Act, which stated in part, a person shall not perform on a living animal any experiment calculated to give pain except subject to the restrictions imposed by this act. And then the rest of that first part is about the potential penalty paid at different levels. Second, it must be performed with a view to the advancement by a new discovery of physiological knowledge or of knowledge which will be useful for saving or prolonging life or alleviating suffering. And also the animal must during the whole of the experiment be under the influence of some anesthetic of sufficient power to prevent the animal feeling pain. Dr. Benjulia, as we come to learn, risks the first stipulation, believes wholeheartedly in the second and fails to adhere in the third, which is what creates him as the villain. Now, notably, Collins does not dwell much on the intricacies of the section itself, so we won't either. It's something that's always around the corner, unlike the horror of the vampire in your face or the shape-shifting man across the parlor. We only see hints of blood, secret machinations. Straley has drawn attention to the problem of genre and theme with this story. Quote, like an autopsy, sensation fiction was drawn from the exposed bowels of an eviscerated social body, and like the section, it morbidly excited its readers' nervous systems. If to write sensation fiction is to dissect and vivisect, then an anti-vivisection sensation novel is a contradictory enterprise. 
Moving to the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which is a classic Gothic novella of fog, darkness, death, and doppelgangers. The lawyer Utterson leads us through a series of encounters and revelations about the beastly Mr. Hyde who has been terrorizing the community with his vices and violence and how he seems to have a particular connection with the respectable Dr. Jekyll. Now, despite Utterson's narrator role, I'm focusing specifically on documents involving both Dr. Lanyon, uh, the mutual friend of Utterson and Jekyll, and Dr. Jekyll himself. In the story, the good doctor is able to conceal his vices by transforming into a second self, the not so good Edward Hyde, with the help of a special red tincture that Jekyll has created in a laboratory experiment. Much scholarship has addressed the doppelganger in the story, so I will focus here on the conditions of Jekyll's experiment and its results, and how this self-prescribed treatment reflects concerns of degeneration and of the city as a whole. Jekyll himself argues that Jekyll and Hyde are both equally valid parts of him. His self-description is reminiscent of both Benjulia's claims to scientific legitimacy and the wording of the Cruelty Act to the animals. I was no more myself when I laid aside restraint and plunged in shame than when I labored in the eye of day at the furtherance of knowledge or the relief of sorrow and suffering. So here the doctor is experimenting on his own suppressed and miserable body, rendering it uncontrollable before endeavoring to suppress it once more. This case of physician heal thyself turns science's furtherance of knowledge and the relief of sorrow and suffering to his own desires so that Jekyll may reconcile two seemingly disparate parts of himself. There's the clinical scientist, physician, and the violent hedonist. Jekyll has a home laboratory where he's created this tincture, which he explains in his confession is part of his whole plan. Let me but escape into my laboratory door, give me but a second or two to mix and swallow the draught that I had always standing ready, and whatever he had done, Edward Hyde would pass away like the stain of breath upon a mirror, and there in his stead, quietly at home, trimming the midnight lamp in his study, a man who could afford to laugh at suspicion would be Henry Jekyll, as shown in the illustration here. What is curious in the doctor's case is that the doctor patient is experimenting on himself, both in the laboratory under controlled circumstances and out on the streets of London where his experiment in release results in scandal and death. Noting the picture on the slide as well as the quotation, you can see how the experimentation flew wildly out of control. The quote is from the little notebook of uh, Dr. Jekyll where he lists down his scientific results and you can see how it breaks down. The experiment had no control and led, leads to Jekyll's final stand in the cabinet and his death and subsequent revelations. Into the theme of scientific discourse and the experimental personalities in the text. They show a strange ambivalence when it comes to the scientific personality in the story, which comes out in the discourse. According to Nicole Buscemi's work, in 19th century medical records of patient narrative, even when aspects of the sufferer's experience are explicitly included within this narrative, they are always colored by the medical practitioner's organization and presentation of the medical record. The medical impulse was often to see the information provided by the patient as running counter to the practitioner's efforts. It is therefore difficult to trust the medicine, even as you are told to mistrust the patient. To begin with, we have the bright young thing, Ovid Vier, who we learn has been mainly successful and seems to be well-liked throughout heart and science. However, he recently lost a patient under circumstances that are left ambiguous. He is suffering under strain to the extent that he cannot finish a page of writing at the start of the novel. And he's somewhat socially awkward, although great with bedside manner and his commitment to the patients. He escapes label as a brain fevered or hysteric type due to his heroic actions in his romance with Carmina and his self-imposed exile in North America. He is the romantic lead, but is notably absent from much of the text's action. Although she is later a patient, Carmina originally serves as a temporary nurse when Ovid faints in the gardens during their stroll, which leads to her first interaction with the notorious Dr. Benjulia, who will later attend and experiment on her. Dr. Benjulia is a fascinating character in that he is nearly impossible to predict. On one hand, he only really seems to care about little Zoe Galilee and even there somewhat distantly. Collins comes right out and tells us that Benjulia is allowing Carmina's brain disease to worsen in order to watch the effects. He's literally transformed her into the woman as experiment subject that was so feared by anti-vivisectionists. And furthermore, he's gently misguiding the infective Dr. Knoll from figuring anything out in his care of Karina, thus turning him into an unwitting lab assistant. Another way that we are meant to judge Dr. Benjulia is that he is working for his own purpose. Although he acknowledges that curing brain disease would change the world, and it seems to be his eventual goal of watching Carmina's decline, his priority is to ensure that he be the one to cure it. 
even subscribes to medical journals, flipping through published documents in order to find out if people are getting ahead of him in science. According to Erica Elka, Benjulia intentionally isolates himself, disconnecting his science from the community it is meant to benefit. However, Benjulia calmly and clinically attends to, to Ovid in the gardens and actually shows his potential for good medical treatment by turning medical jargon into soothing layman's terms for Carmina's benefit when Ovid faints, stating, quote, this pump is out of order and I'm the carpenter. Give me time and I'll set it right again. Also, his correspondence in giving reference for Ovid when Ovid goes to Canada is interestingly helpful. Although Ovid's hostess indignantly describes Benjulia as a brute, the letter that he has written to recommend treatment for Ovid, while probably not as flowery and friendly as a gentleman ought to write, is really just clinically and brusque rather than overtly rude, saying, the man who brings this is an overworked surgeon named Ovid Beer. He wants rest and good air. Don't encourage him to use his brains and give him information enough to take him by the shortest way to the biggest desert in Canada. End of the letter. He also stands up to Mrs. Galilee when, he insults Car when she insults Carmina, and he is the one to have Carmina removed from the house to safety. His position as an influential man of science shields him from close scrutiny except by family and the suspicious Ovid. His lack of action in watching Carmina decline is malpractice, but to him, science comes first, and he genuinely believes that he is doing the right thing, which makes him all the more dangerous of a villain. With the help of the sickly Ovid's absence, the clueless Dr. Null, and the ineffectual Mr. Galilee, the masculine presence in the household is one that initially fails Carmina, contributing to her illness symbolically, if not literally. From almost the moment she enters the Galilee household, Carmina is under constant passive emotional attacks and gaslighting courtesy of Mrs. Galilee. Mrs. Galilee, a scientific Victorian woman, has a sense of also being quite isolated like Dr. Benjulia, but is isolated in the midst of a very busy domestic life. As a Victorian wife and mother, she goes through all the right motions of maintaining appearances uh, at all costs, which literally costs the family quite a lot of money and creates her problems. However, her true joy is in science, which she has had to find time to enjoy and indulge in. Although Mrs. Galilee does not knowingly treat Carmina as a specimen, her efforts to monitor, manipulate, and test Carmina point to the domestic sphere as yet another site for experimental medicine. Galilee is heavily judged for being the catalyst of Carmina's brain disease, which is apparently brought on by the shock of an illegitimacy claim made by Galilee in an effort to delegitimize Carmina's inheritance. However, Elsa also suggests that science is not quite the tool of the victim that it seems in the text, saying, quote, the scientific life comes in fact to enhance a sense of social responsibility with kinder, gentler portrayals of science that push against the deeply negative portrayal of vivisection, showing when and how science is both an appropriate and necessary medium for positive human interaction. In our first meeting with Mrs. Galilee, she's able to prescribe a simple and sensible treatment after Carmina's sudden faint, which ironically was brought on by looking at Mrs. Galilee, apparently. Mrs. Galilee in the process remains calm while others are distressed. Another aspect of her potential for good is that she keeps books of interest in her library and is constantly reading, which that Wilkie encourages as an alternative to plotting. Look to your library table, learned lady, and take the appropriate means of relief that it offers. The form that Harker and Renfield's Chronicles of Illness take have somewhat informal tones and limited patient involvement in their composition. For example, although Sister Agatha communicates with Nina via letter, her most meaningful communications occur via the postscript of the letter, once Jonathan is no longer awake to participate in the write-up of his breakdown, and later in her private conversations with Nina. In Dracula, Sister Agatha's letter and conversation with Nina creates a case file that mediates between the patient and the family, while also blocking the flow of some important information. In the pages presenting Sister Agatha's letter to Nina, the postscript abandons the formal tone of the letter itself, which is implied to be at least partially dictated by Jonathan, in order to convey further truths than perhaps even Jonathan is aware of. The doctor, unnamed, is cited as presenting the logical diagnosis, but the supernatural causes of Harker's breakdown are considered to be the neurotic ramblings of a sick man. The reader meets Renfield, by contrast, as a result of Seward's moody picking of Renfield's delusions after Seward's rejection by Lucy. Seward confesses that he is interrogating Renfield about his delusions to the point of cruelty, but does not include details about what exactly he said. After some rather vague Latin rambling, the doctor decides to record his interactions with and impressions of Renfield, saying, if there be anything behind this instinct, it will be valuable to trace it afterwards accurately, so I had better commence to do so, therefore. 
suddenly switching from a rather sullenly whimsical diary entry to doctor's notes on a patient. Seward's clinical level of fascination with Renfield is such that one could argue Renfield has absorbed the doctor's life. Renfield um, really wishes to absorb human life. And here, when Seward says it would almost be worthwhile to complete the experiment, it seems to bring him down to his level, imagining using Renfield as a guinea pig and bringing Ben Julia to mind. There is something hungry and obsessive in Seward's repeated desire for sufficient cause to perform his experiments and the way that he personally identifies with Renfield's record keeping habit. But Seward eventually delineates himself at last from his patient by writing, I must only wait on hopeless and work, work, work. Dr. Jekyll is defined by his hypernormality. As a scientist and doctor, he is considered to have been a bit wild in his youth, but overcompensates now and is considered a bit of a stiff. It is in Jekyll's discussion of his will made out to Hyde with the lawyer Utterson that we catch a glimpse through the wording at the cause of his tension that indicates what sort of person is hidden underneath. Jekyll jokes that I never saw a man so distressed as you were by my will, unless it were that high down pedant Lanyon at what he called my scientific heresies. Here we can see how experimental medicine has consumed Jekyll and destroyed his friendship. And it is hinted that Jekyll's experimental medicine is bad or at least worthy of suspicion. However, Utterson's problem is that as a lay person, he cannot appreciate that Jekyll and Lanyon's scientific beliefs frame them and define them as both men and moral figures, thinking to himself, they have only differed on some point of science. We first meet Hyde, the worst part of Jekyll, when he tramples a small child on the street in the pre-dawn hours, and it seems purposeful that the child Hyde tramples is then immediately examined by a medical professional. Quote, the doctor for whom she had been sent put in his appearance. This moment potentially foreshadows that the doctor who comes to the scene is a mix of professional and violent. We begin to see a professional and violent doctor in one. Per Enfield's account of the event, quote, the doctor's case was what struck me. He was a usual cut and dry apothecary of no particular age and color with a strong Edinburgh accent and about as emotional as a bagpipe. Well, sir, he was like the rest of us. Every time he looked at my prisoner, I saw that sawbones turn sick and white with the desire to kill him. So moving to literary brain fever. It's important to distinguish between medically diagnosed brain fever and the literary version within the Victorian age. Medically speaking, brain fever was described at the time as a disease known as inflammation of the brain, a right recognizable medical entity at the close of the 18th century. And many of the symptoms and the post-mortem evidence were consistent with some forms of meningitis or encephalitis. According to this medical writing of the early 19th century, Symptoms often include restlessness or moaning, and in severe cases, the patient rolls the head from side to side and engages in noisy vociferation and screaming, while in other cases, he is quiet or even somnolent. Mental confusion is a universal symptom, accompanied at times by erratic behavior, forgetfulness, and irritability. There was a belief that brain fever could have physical or emotional causes, as, quote, both physicians and laymen believed that emotional shock or excessive intellectual activity could produce a severe and prolonged fever. The reading public would have known the physical and emotional causes of brain fever as it was not only the subject of medical texts but of popular fiction. Brain fever ran rampant in 19th century fiction as a plot device, described as an illness cited from the Alvin E. Roden and Jack D. Key's medical casebook of Dr. Arthur Conan Doyle with some meaningful symptoms. One that fo which follows quickly on a severe emotional shock which exhibits weight loss, weakness, pallor, and high fever and which has a protracted course. Most patients recover, but insanity or death is possible. The signs of literary brain fever intertwine with the effects of strained clinical attention for Carmina, the empirically sourced nervous issues for Harker, and fevered fear of being found out for Jekyll. An argument could be made that experimental medicine in at least two of these three cases could actually cause brain fever if it is performed unethically. In two out of three of our texts, there are explicit references to brain fever suffered by the lead characters. Dracula's Jonathan Harker is probably the most notable as following the trauma of his experience at Castle Dracula, the sanitarium nurse sister Agatha writes to Jonathan's wife Mina saying, he has had some fearful shock, so says our doctor. And in his delirium, his ravings have been dreadful of wolves and poison and blood, of ghosts and demons, and I fear to say of what? Harker's ma failed masculine role in the relationship is mediated by sister Agatha's intervention as she tries to facilitate communication between the conveniently long distance couple saying, I write by desire of Mr. Jonathan Harker, who is himself not strong enough to write. A sentence that reduces Harker's sense of desire to a passive and weak dictation to their go-between. In Heart and Science, we get a case that approaches brain fever, but which is here referred to as brain disease. 
after a long period spent essentially trapped in the Galilee house and subjected to ever growing strain between the manipulative forces of Mrs. Galilee and for some time the governess, Miss Minerva, Carmina has what is referred to in turn as nervous excitement, nervous derangement, nervous fever, and complicated hysterical disturbance. Even the treatment that is used to heal Carmina is explicitly described in its manuscript as helping two women who had suffered a moral shock, resulting in the, the treatment of brain disease. This treatment is in a document, a manuscript given to Ovid by an unnamed dying scientist who passes on the knowledge of how to cure this brain disease and who takes pains to state explicitly in his manuscript that this treatment was discovered solely through bedside practice and not experimentation. It also lambests vivisection conveniently. In Jekyll and Hyde, Jekyll is described as Dr. Lan by Dr. Lanyon as possibly dealing with a case of cerebral disease. And Jekyll's confession states that under the strain of this continually impending doom, I became in my own person a creature eaten up and emptied by fever, languidly weak in both body and mind. Lanyon himself suffers a terrible moral shock that drastically shortens his lifespan when he realizes the extent of Jekyll's experimentation on himself. I believe here that brain fever in its literary sense as shown in these texts, while considered a shock and possibly being diagnosed different ways, is in a sense a nervous disorder that can come about in the text due to exposure to evil. So next we have madness and asylums. Earlier in the 19th century, it was believed that there was a physiological cause behind nervous disorders. James Copland, writing in the mid 19th century, claimed that these neuroses depend upon physical disease in connection with a morbidly exalted state of sensibility. This physical disease commences in the digestive organs attended with morbid organic sensibility, part of a strange series of links being made in the medical literature between the mind and body in an effort to restore masculine confidence. This was particularly as hysteria not only struck the weak, fearful, and introspective, but which lay in wait for the moment when even the exponents of the manly virtues of resolution and perseverance might be overtaken by self-doubt. As time went on, however, it was no longer linked with abdominal issues. Thomas Laycock writing in 1840 was convinced that it was lack of power of self-control to curb the vicious habits which excited the brain and debilitated the nervous system that turned men into hysterics by, quote, reducing the blood to a state similar to that of a hysterical female. He noted the paleness and what he saw as effeminacy of several patients further linking male nervous disorders to effeminacy in blood or lack thereof. Although the field of neurology would then develop over the century, medical articles still often kept the language. The stigma and shame surrounding male nervous systems continued on into the 1890s, and by this point, there was a greater drive to attribute nervous disorders to external sources. Renfield's mental illness, in contrast to Harker's, is described in terms of his being a zoophagus, Stewart's own term, but his symptoms are vague enough that one could potentially assign various neuroses to him. Stoker either knowingly or unknowingly sets Renfield against Harker as an opposite, both physically and in terms of personality. Seward reports Renfield as having sanguine temperament, great physical strength, and morbidly excitable. I presume that the sanguine temperament itself and the disturbing influence end in a mentally accomplished finish, a possibly dangerous man. In the 19th century, the medical case narrative differentiated between the reports of the doctor and the patient as respectively reliable and unreliable, as I've discussed. Therefore, Harker's feverish ramblings to Sister Agatha are considered unreliable by virtue of their content, but as a patient, his word might be generally discounted or distrusted, as the perspective of the sufferer was given less and less weight in the production of medical knowledge as the 19th century progressed. It is important to specify that Harker and Renfield, while both victims of a vampire messing with their minds, are being treated in vastly different settings. By the time that Stoker was writing Dracula, Victorian asylums had undergone a massive change in both popularity and purported purpose. Originally conceived of as a refuge dispensing specialist care, by the end of the 19th century, asylums were considered more akin to containment areas for society's undesirables, as according to Mark Stevens, England's neighborhoods were given an opportunity to be cleansed of the unable or the uncooperative. The image of the asylum as disciplined exile for the patients, who could range from a suicidal woman to a child with learning disabilities, was supported in part by the growing idea in the late 19th century that contrary to earlier hopes, patients might be incurable. Renfield would not qualify as one of the stereotypically neurotic men of Victorian imagination, as through Dr. Seward's eyes, Renfield's described virility is what makes him dangerous. Ovid Beer, our hero who is not around for much of the story's action, after receiving what is delicately referred to as the warning from overwrought nature, travels to Canada for his rest. 
Mrs. Galilee is also briefly confined to an asylum after a nervous breakdown compounded by being physically assaulted in her home by Carmina's protective old nurse, Teresa. Mrs. Galilee recovers on her own, unlike Carmina, with the lack of care for her mental breakdown, as is perhaps implied to be due to an internal evil rather than an external catalyst, is indicative of the asylum taking in the unwanted or inconvenient woman. Jekyll himself also attempts to plead insanity for murdering the elderly Caro, saying, I declare at least before God, no man morally sane could have been guilty of that crime upon so pivotal, pitiful a provocation, and that I struck in no more reasonable spirit than that in which a sick child may break a plaything. Hyde's violent streak, so long repressed by the austere Jekyll, has rendered him morally insane according to his own declaration. Gordon Hirsch argues there is a sense that the terrifying inexplicable violence within the person and within society will break out once again, that the conventional restraints will shatter and the belief in personal continuity and identity will prove unsustainable. Finally, moving to atavism, degeneration and morality. Much has been written about Hyde's animalistic qualities and the themes of degeneration in the text. I bring it up here to point to an interesting moment in the story where Jekyll and Hyde are both active in the body at once and that they use that moment to write doctor's orders. Dr. Jekyll is aware of his own degeneration, but the breakdown into animalistic behaviors is uneven. He says, then I remembered that of my original character, one part remained to me. I could write in my own hand. And once I had conceived that kindling spark, the way that I must follow became lighted up from end to end. He is then able to write to Lanyon in Hyde's body to request that he bring Jekyll slash Hyde his tincture in order to change back to Jekyll. He's effectively giving doctor's orders in a quasi-Jekyll, quasi-Hyde form. On this topic of atavism, consider Enfield's famous description of Hyde to Mr. Utterson. There is something wrong with his appearance, something displeasing, something downright detestable. He must be deformed somewhere. He gives a strong feeling of deformity, although I couldn't specify the point. Michael Kelly notes that some of the great anxieties of the time which come to the head in the novel include acute anxiety about otherness and social change anxiety in which multiple sources converge, hence also of anxiety about fluid identities, lining up with what Gordon Hirsch identifies as the ultimate threat posed in Jekyll and Hyde. Not that one person is actually two, but that he is many, thus not really one person at all, but lacking a coherent self or identity. Craig Moorhead argues that Victorian writers use the concept of cosmopolitan criminality to strengthen social cohesion and codify the idea of the Englishness in order to exaggerate and institutionalize the criminal threat of outsiders. If we apply this to Jekyll and Hyde, the implication of the text message of hypocrisy extends to revealing the atavistic enemy within the gates. A cosmopolitan criminal Hyde is a degenerate criminal who masquerades in an English gentleman's skin suit. There's a feeling that sensation novels were also a show of lower moral character as well as vivisection itself. Erica also has argued that about vivisection, it appears to show a direct correlation between the rise of the experimental laboratory and the collapse of empathy between humans and other living beings, both human and non-human alike. And in his preface, Collins refers to it as the result of the habitual practice of cruelty, no matter under what pretense, in fatally deteriorating the nature of man. And what is an interesting parallel to descriptions of Hyde as being ape-like, Dr. Benjulia's first big scene with him involves visiting the gardens to observe a monkey with possible brain fever, also associating him potentially with atavism. Seward's indulgence of Renfield's pets and general whimsy is interrupted at points by Seward's re-realizations that Renfield is potentially dangerous, but Seward instead sounds interested and ex experimental rather than afraid. The man is an undeveloped homicidal maniac. I shall test him with his present craving and see how it will work out. Then I shall know more. After drugging his patient and taking Renfield's notebook, Seward realizes that what Renfield desires is to absorb as many lives as he can, adding to the idea of animalistic qualities in Azufagus. And finally, we have the question of whether experimental medicine, which thus far has appeared mainly warped and the cause of illness, can be justified or used to heal. Buscemi notes that Dracula's case notes imply failure in the treatment of a patient can have positive results in the production of medical knowledge. Here she's describing the patients Renfield and Lucy and the failures within their treatment. The notes and communications on their treatment can relate to the novel's use of the multivocal medical casebook, a journal kept by medical students, including their and their superiors' opinions, as well as a careful documentation of the patient's perspective. Now Seward, whose meticulous recording keeping is praised by Van Helsing, is one of multiple voices that contributes his experiences with Renfield and later Lucy to the pile of information that will be eventually transcribed by Nina Harker. 
unlike Nina, who is deliberately excluded soon after the document collection is complete on the grounds of protecting her mental health. Jonathan Harker remains in the work and in the hunt as a quiet presence rather than a leader or an expert. Tabitha Sparks has argued that the scientific plot competes with but is ultimately trounced by the marriage plot, but Elsa argues that science enables the Carmina and Ovid love story. It is experimental medical intervention brought by Ovid and sourced from the unnamed dying man that saves Carmina. And as Elsa points out, Ovid is a surgeon who in spite of his initial coldness is still excellent at the bedside and one who shuns labs as a source of medical advancement, saying then Julia relies on experiment whereas Ovid's research remains experiential. Elsa argues that good science must come first if both romantic protagonists are to survive, proving the power of science to heal both bodies and narrative rifts. Very convenient that, as Straley notes, Ovid returns just in time to save her, fortuitously with an unpublished manuscript outlining a cure for her illness, fully derived from the results of bedside practice and innocent of the useless and detestable cruelties which go by the name of the dissection. Dr. Benjulia commits suicide, cutting off yet another anti-vivisectionist after the loss of his beliefs. The bad doctors are punished, the good doctors make good. The story of Jekyll and Hyde ends with the end of Jekyll. As a morality tale versus a medical one, it is difficult to say. It is hard to see the ending as anything but a sympathetic shift in Jekyll's direction, albeit a judgmental one. The treatment here has failed as well. The experimentation as well as his attempts to repress the self. From these texts, I believe we can surmise that although experimental medicine may bring about new and exciting developments, they must not pass the boundaries of polite and law-abiding behavior. And that's it.